Great. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? I want to uh, welcome everyone to the CLSA webinar series. Um, I'm Lauren Griffiths. I'm uh, the CLSA, one of the Associate Scientific Directors at McMaster University. And I have the great pleasure of introducing some of our presenters for our seminar today. So I would like to um, introduce our presenters today. The presentation is going to be uh, Definitions of Social Isolation. Um, and this is a pilot study using some of the CLSA data. Um, you know, we're very excited about our presentations now actually um, including some of the results using the CLSA data. And this is one of the first studies that has really um, has uh, been you know, moved along and, and has used some of the, this important data. So the two presenters are Verena Menek and Nancy Newell. And Verena is a professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences in the College of Medicine at the University of Manitoba. And her main research interests lie in the area of healthy aging, determinants of healthy aging, age-friendly communities, and health care utilization among older adults, uh, particularly at the end of life. And she is currently the Manitoba lead of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And the Manitoba site's claim to fame is they have one of the, one of the lowest cancellation rates, even um, in, the, in the dreary winter snowstorms. Um, Nancy Newell is an assistant professor of psychology at Brandon University and a research affiliate with the Center on Aging at the University of Manitoba. And her work has examined some of the causes and consequences of loneliness for older Manitobans in terms of health and longevity. And most recently, she has turned her attention to exploring what types of service or interventions might help people become less lonely or isolated and more socially connected. Uh, so without any further ado, I am going to pass the slides along to Nancy to start the webinar. And welcome, Nancy. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. If not, I'm assuming someone will type that in and let me know. Thanks for joining uh, Verena and I online today, and uh, greetings from Manitoba. Um, this is our study title, but I just want to start with this one right here. We're going to put it right out there front and center. Uh, Verena came up with this great mashup here of, of um, terms. And basically what we're starting out is saying that defining isolation right now at this juncture is confusing. And it's quite honestly uh, frustrating. Um, we're grappling with definitional issues and other researchers are, are doing the same. And of course, people are trying to apply, uh, program planners um, trying to assess isolation, their clients are probably just as frustrated as we are. So we wanted to start <laughs> and put that right out from the get-go. Um, and so uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit, and we're able to, to continue to grapple with this and try to disentangle some of these issues with the CLSA, so we're excited about doing that. So as I mentioned, uh, it's confusing right now. There's no consistency in terms of definitions of, of social isolation. And um, from, from my point of view, the second bullet there was kind of where I entered this. I, I studied loneliness for a number of years, and uh, I began working with a community organization in Winnipeg. And we really wanted to find out if uh, one of the programs that they were offering, if they were reaching their target group, and one of their main target groups for their program were the socially isolated. So I went into the um, literature um, intending to find a scale that I could find a cutoff to identify people who are isolated or not. And that's when I discovered, um, to a great extent, the confusion around definitions. And there's, uh, in terms of scales that have established cutoffs so that we can identify people who are isolated or not, they are few and far between. So that's something that, that was a, a bit of a frustration for me, trying to simply ask and answer that question of, are we meeting our, our target group there? 
There's no gold standard instrument, and as the mishmash here of the isolation term shows, um, terms are, are used almost interchangeably and, and certainly inconsistently at, at this point. One of the things that we, as researchers anyway, seem to agree on, although there's still some confusion around this, um, is distinguishing isolation from loneliness. So I put the two definitions here around social isolation and loneliness on your screen. So there's general agreement um, that social isolation on the left there is more objective. So it's more of an objective situation. Um, here's a definition that um, it's an objective situation of a person and refers to the absence of relationships and contacts. So absence of contacts and contact and um, places um, social isolation actually on one spectrum and social participation at the other. And we oftentimes contrast this with, with more um, subjective experience, which is loneliness. So um, that's one, one kind of way that we agree in terms of, of definitions. There's, there's a lot more agreement in the loneliness literature on how to define loneliness, by the way. Um, probably the most common definition is a cognitive approach, which suggests that loneliness stems from a mismatch basically between um, the relationships that you want compared to the relationships that you have. So loneliness is, is basically a, a perception that your, either the quantity or quality of relationships are insufficient in, in some way. So looking at the next slide here, what's important um, here is that um, this can tell, uh, a picture like this, we've got Elizabeth on, on the left and John on the right in and, and our relationships, their social network structure, um, people in their inner circle versus more of their, you know, people that are close but in their outer circles. This can tell us about relationships, maybe uh, numbers, maybe even frequency of contact. We could ask people about their contact with these relationships. But we really can't say anything about loneliness based on these um, schemas um, because, uh, and this is a nice contrast here between the objectives. Elizabeth has a lot you know, of, of relationships objectively on paper, but she may be lonely or she may not be lonely. Similarly, John, who has maybe fewer relationships, um, we really don't know until we ask John whether he is, is lonely or not. Um, this doesn't also, this, this kind of uh, social network type idea doesn't tell us about the role of these relationships. Um, are people providing um, them with uh, tangible support, emotional support, et cetera? So it doesn't tell us about social support either. So there's a few dimensions here that we're trying to disentangle, um, and, and this helps us with definition and, and measurement. But basically, when we contrast isolation and, and loneliness, we can see that you know, this explains groups of people who might have a lot of relationships, like Elizabeth, and, and might be lonely. And it helps explain people who might have few relationships who might be more socially isolated, but also might not be lonely. So um, I'm going to return to kind of definitional issues, and, and Brian is going to talk about what we're doing with CLSA data. Before doing that, I also I just wanted to talk a little bit more about what we what we know uh, around isolation and, and loneliness, and um, kind of where the literature I think is going in terms of uh, looking at interventions to to try to help people um, overcome their isolation and loneliness. So what we know, um, interesting for me anyway, I've been studying loneliness for a number of years, and we used to have to spend a lot of time on a slide like this. We used to have to justify why study loneliness, why focus on isolation. Um, and in the last five, six years, I've seen that we don't need to be spending enough, as much time. This seems to be more and more accepted that isolation and loneliness are important um, health risks in particular. There's been a real sense here that, that's changed them. And I think there's been a couple of game changers. Um, in particular, I haven't put references here. Sorry, if you want any references, please contact me. Um, citations, please contact me after. But uh, one of the game changers, I think, was Cassiopo and colleagues out of Chicago. And his lab and his research really helped to show um, how loneliness in particular could directly cause um, health difficulty, had direct um, impact on our bodies. So he looked at things like immune system response, blood pressure, 
sleep. Um, and so I think his research in his lab and others um, who've studied the direct mechanisms was a real game changer in, in terms of recognizing um, loneliness and isolation as health risks. And there's other um, studies here listed um, uh, that, that have also shown um, the relationship between isolation and, and health. I think another game changer um, was this study here um, out of, uh, from Holt Lundstad in 2010. And if you haven't read this uh, paper, I would, I would recommend it because I think it's one of the most strongly written documents um, that I've read. Uh, you know, normally researchers, we like to say, uh, you know, more, more needs, research needs to be done. We don't quite know or we have tentative conclusions. This was a really strongly worded document. It was based on a meta-analysis of over 100 studies that looked at social relationships and mortality. And she basically said, listen, folks, we've got enough evidence here to show that uh, social relationship factors like isolation and loneliness are important risk factors, and they may, they're, they're, as, they're comparable or even, um, even more important than other established risk factors, including smoking and obesity. So I think this, this was really a game changer in, ter in terms of, of saying, okay, this is an important um, health factor that we need to be paying attention to. We also know that um, isolation and loneliness is, is relatively common in older in, in later life. Um, keeping definitional uh, limitations in mind, um, a couple of studies out of BC and some, several studies out of Europe um, have shown that up to 20% of older adults are socially isolated. And a number of studies um, on loneliness suggest that between 20 to 40% report at a given time being moderately to severely lonely with around 7 to 9% of older adults reporting being severely lonely at a given point in time. Of course, these findings differ depending on, on definitions and samples and age groups used. We also know a lot about um, risk factors. So a lot of the literature is focused on, on risk factors for uh, social isolation and loneliness, and a lot of them overlap. Um, we've taken an attempt here at, at grouping them, so social groups and demographic factors, including things like uh, gender, marital status, uh, social groups, including um, groups like new immigrants to Canada, for example, we know that they're at risk for being isolated and, and lonely. Life transitions and events, uh, life events and transitions, we mean here are things like bereavement, uh, losing a spouse, retirement, um, loss in, in certain roles. And as a psychologist, I spend a lot of time looking at the, the kind of personality or psychological factors, um, perceptions of control over our relationships, ex expectations around our relationships, for example, for example um, health-related, um, mobility, um, environmental factors such as transportation. Those of you who are um, uh, involved in age-friendly, these are the kinds of um, factors that we know would place people at risk of being isolated. Um, or lonely. And all of these factors are really entry points um, for intervention. So for example, if someone is, is um, not able to be as socially active as they want to um, due to transportation, that's an entry point. Okay, we, that's where we would need to intervene. If it's more psychological, maybe they've got, um, you know, different expectations around their relationships, that's another entry point to intervention, um, which, which is really where, where the literature is going. But unfortunately, at this point, we know more about the risk factors um, than we know about how to intervene and how to help people overcome uh, loneliness and, and isolation, which is basically what I state here on this next slide. Um, so that's why I, I see now that we've kind of set the tone in terms of the importance of isolation and loneliness to our health, the literature is really going towards, well, what can we, what can we do about it? How can we help people? And unfortunately, the, the literature just is, is not there at this point. And it comes back to, to definitional issues in a lot of ways. If we're trying to target people, um, try, trying to um, identify people who are isolated, um, we need to have good definitions and good measures. So the problem, some of the problems we, as we see it um, is right now, we, we, when we talk to organizations here in Winnipeg, for example, um, they say one thing that they, they really have a struggle with is how to find people, how to identify um, people who are socially isolated. Um, the UK came out with a, a report they called the Hidden Citizens Document 
um, talking about that issue of how to identify isolated individuals in the community. Another um, problem that we have is, is we need to know more about how we can target interventions that people at risk of or who are experiencing isolation and loneliness. And, in, and really importantly, what works best and for which groups of, of people. And, and again, this comes back um, to, to measuring. Um, in order to, to target groups of individuals who are isolated or not, and to be able to track change um, over time, we, we really need to, um, better measures and better agreement around definitions around uh, social isolation. At this point, um, when we take a look at the measures, and, and Brian and I have had lots of discussion around this, there's a lot of confusion. Um, and, and we and, and others have, have looked at it in terms of kind of three features that um, scales or measures are, are either including one of these features, two of these features, three of these features. There's a real mix in terms of measurement. So structural idea, um, so measuring the, the number of people in a person's life, the frequency of contact. Um, measures sometimes include functional concepts what, uh, around social support, so what people in, in people's lives are doing for them, tangible support or emotional support, things like that. And uh, loneliness is sometimes included in definitions and measurements of uh, social isolation. Um, and, and some studies are including simple indicators like living alone as a measure of loneliness or measure of, of isolation. So there's a real uh, mixture here. Interestingly enough, uh, Val Torta et al. just came out, if you haven't seen this paper, 2016 BMJ. Um, and she, again, uh, just like we're trying to do, we're trying to make sense of the measures that are being used. So she included, I don't know, about 20 measures or, or more maybe of isolation and loneliness. And she's trying to understand how how they uh, line up with different dimensions. And she's chosen two dimensions, um, structural, so measurements that are more structural in nature versus functional, and those that are more subjective in nature um, versus more objective. And she's got a great graph that you can check out that is place different measures that, we, that we're using right now in the literature and where they stand. And so Brian is gonna be um, talking about the, the um, MOS, uh, social support survey, for example, that's in CLSA, and Voltorta uh, has uh, classified this one more as being a functional measure, um, tapping into more of the functional side of relationships, social support, and being more on the objective um, um, end of the spectrum in terms of, of measurements. So we come back to this graph in a lot of ways, um, different dimensions that we're able to to um, try to understand from people um, so social network versus function of relationships versus loneliness. And so this is kind of what we're trying to do and we're able to do um, with CLSA data, which is what uh, Raina will talk about next. So my task today is to talk a bit about uh, some results using CLSA. And again, I hope you can hear me. And if not, I'm sure somebody will let me know. Uh, we're using the CLSA tracking cohort. So ages 45 to 85, 21,000 odd people. And uh, some of the analyses that I'll show you are based on the 21,000 uh, people and some are only uh, including older adults and some of the analyses are weighted so then they would be weighted up to the population. Uh, just in terms of um, measures, and um, this really takes uh, what Nancy was talking about uh, a step further into what is actually in CLSA, we have social network size variables. So it, it, people were asked about the number of children uh, siblings, relatives, close friends, and neighbors. So we can use those as a measure of the network size. We also have a measure, uh, measures of the frequency of contact with each of the network members, and that ranges on a scale from you know, a lot to not much, really, and you have the details there on the slide. 
We also have social participation measures. So it's uh, eight activities that uh, people have participated in. How often do they participate in those? And we can think of those as as contacts with people, not with close people, not people close to the person, but still contact with people. So they kind of are, uh, if you will, at the outer edges of a network. Uh, uh, an indication of the network size. Uh, as Man Man Nancy mentioned, we have social support variables. There's the 19 item medical outcomes uh, study survey, and there are four types of social support in that scale. One is affectionate support, and I've given you examples here. So it's someone who hugs you. So you can imagine it's really somebody uh, who gives you that direct support, so emotional support. Emotional support then specifically is a little broader, so for example, someone you can count on to listen to when you need to talk. Still emotional support, but not as close as that affectionate one, uh, the first type. Uh, we have positive social interaction. Uh, that's kind of having somebody to, to go out, hang out with, have fun with, uh, relax with. And then lastly, tangible support somebody to give specific help, uh, like here with uh, being confined to bed. So uh, this would also be called sometimes in other uh, literature, tangible, uh, instrumental support. In this scale, it's uh, tangible support. Now, when we start to use the data, uh, we actually typically can't just use the variable. So there's quite a bit of a recoding going on. And what uh, is meant by the, the cartoon here is simply an if you can see it, maybe not that well in the middle, then a miracle happens. So we do a lot of recoding of variables until we get derived variables. I don't have time to talk about that, but if you have questions, I'll certainly be happy to answer those. What I want to do next is give you a, a bit of a comparison of the prevalence of social isolation using different definitions. And really the purpose here is to show you that depending on how we define social isolation and particularly how we cut off those cutoffs of when do we call somebody socially isolated versus not, we get really quite different results. So let me take you through this table. So uh, overall, so this would be based on all CL tracking CLSA participants, uh, so 45 to 85. Um, and in terms of overall, one definition that's been used of social isolation is living alone. So we have 23% of people who live alone. That could be one definition of social isolation. Uh, when we go more specifically into frequency of contact, though, we get quite a different pattern. The first, so the second column there, no contact with social network members in the last six months of the year, that would probably, we would call those as extremely socially isolated. Uh, we only have 1.4%. Then when we move into a more uh, a different cutoff, different cutoffs, a little more lenient cutoffs, if you will, we have prevalence of 8.5 versus 26.8. Again, the point being here, depending on your cutoffs, depending on, depending on your definition, you get quite different uh, results. The second point I wanted to make here is that, that our, the characteristics that are related to social isolation vary depending on our def definitions chosen. So take a look at the age effect and, and uh, what we get under living alone. We have a not an unusual pattern here, not a surprising pattern, that, that quite a lot more uh, older people age 65 plus are uh, living alone. But there's really no difference when we look at our other definitions. So the prevalence rates are pretty similar across the age groups. The same thing happens when we look at, at, at gender, and we could look at these at other factors too, but here I'm just showing gender. Uh, living alone, mostly, well, quite a lot more. Women live alone, again, that makes sense. We have that older women, widowed women effect happening here, but that's not the core case for the other definitions. And I would like you to keep in mind the gender effect that flips to the men, that men are slightly more likely to be socially isolated, They're given the other definitions than women. So keep that in mind as I show you some other results. The next piece then I wanted to show you is um, 
is looking at the relationship then between social isolation or what we now call social network groups and social support. So how does that network size, the frequency of contact, how does that relate to what people, what the kind of supports people actually get? So first of all, we conduct a cluster analysis to group people and I'll go into a little more detail in a moment. Uh, we then compare them, these network clusters or groups based on sociodemographic and health variables. And then we look at the relationship between those network groups and social support. I can also mention that in a, a additional analysis, we're looking at health outcomes, but I really don't have time to talk about those right now, but uh, we were moving that way as well. So just a word on cluster analysis. Cluster analysis tries to group people. So it's, it's not like factor analysis, uh, which groups variables, it group, uh, cluster analysis groups people. And we're trying to find groups that are similar, groups of people that are similar to each other, but different from the other groups. And in this case, our clustering variables are social network size, frequency of contact with social network members, and the social participation variables. Uh, the, the, the image you have here is simply a hypothetical example, uh, which shows you that we're trying to identify these groups of people that are similar to each other. Now, if you've ever done cluster, cluster analysis or factor analysis, you realize, you, you know that this is not a, not a perfect science. You, you have to interpret clusters. You have to, uh, to make judgment calls as to how many clusters or factors in factor analysis you want to include. And the, diff, and the real challenge is how to label them. So actually, our team has gone back and forth many, many times as to the labels we attach to clusters. So let me give you the results. Uh, we're finding six clusters, and just as a general comment, uh, they generally move from from larger networks networks to more restricted networks. So let me take you through this. Uh, uh, they're ordered, by the way, in terms of their prevalence. So the diverse cluster. This is people who have um, large and diverse social networks, they have a lot of family, they have a lot of friends, they have lots of social participation. We have 25% of those. We have a second cluster with, uh, which really is very similar to the first one, with, but just doesn't have many siblings, uh, so 24% roughly, so still very diverse, very socially connected. Then we have a family friend focused cluster. Um, they're, less likely to see uh, neighbors, less participation in social activities, also generally smaller family circle. But because they have kind of less of that broader network, we've called them family friend focused. Um, then we have another cluster, uh, about 14% that have a few children, but uh, relatively higher on contacts with neighbors. We have a few friend cluster. Uh, we have with, with few close friends, hence few friends, and they don't really participate in social activities. Um, and then we have a restricted cluster with few friends, and really they're deficient on pretty much everything. They're quite restricted. When you add up these percentages, you can see that about half of the population then is really has very diverse uh, social networks. Uh, then there's some in-between folks, and then at the bottom we have roughly 21% that have rather restricted social networks. So when you look at, and now I've added this arrow at the, on the side, really we have uh, a continuum we, from, from so more socially isolated, the two clusters at the bottom, to more socially integrated, the two clusters at the top. So what we can do next is see how do these groups differ in terms of socio-demographic and health factors. And we looked at a number of those. I'm just going to mention a few things. Our diverse cluster is relatively young. By the way, I should have mentioned, and I failed to do so, that this analysis only focuses on the older people, so 65 to 85. So when I say young, this is 65 to 74. So they're relatively young and healthy. 
Our diverse low sibling cluster is older, so 75 plus, and that kind of makes sense probably. We can imagine that these people, because they're older, they have uh, lost siblings. Uh, some of their siblings may have died. Our family friend focused cluster is kind of in the middle. We, there's nothing really unusual about them on any of the characteristics. Our few children cluster tends to be more single. Again, that makes sense. Uh, a lot of these people probably were never uh, in a partnership. They will have not had children. The few friends one is an interesting one because it tends to be more uh, men and also quite a high proportion of married individuals in there. And then we have the restricted cluster, which is that which is a female, more single cluster. Now, when we start to compare then with uh, the, the, the social support types that these p groups of people get. Let me just explain here that we're using our diverse group as the comparison group and we're doing multivariate analyses. We're controlling for sociodemographic factors as well as health factors in the analyses and to see so how does each one of the clusters differ from the diverse, which is the most socially integrated cluster group. When we look at the diverse low sibling cluster, there's no difference. So they're really very similar. And that kind of, again, makes sense that both groups are very, very uh, socially engaged. They, they have a lot of people around them, a lot of friends and social activities. Where it gets more interesting is in terms of our middle two clusters, the family friend focused one. So again, they, they, they tend to be a little more, just have a closer, uh, smaller network, more, again, as the title seems to suggest, family friend focused rather than the broad network. They tend to have less emotional support and positive social interactions. Uh, no difference in terms of affectionate and tangible support relative to diverse cluster. The opposite happens when we have the few children cluster. They differ in terms of affectionate and tangible support. So what we think is going on here is that once you start to lack broader social networks, you get some deficiencies in support, but more in terms of those broader, that positive interaction or having fun with other people, getting out, hanging out, uh, having somebody to talk to, rather than those, uh, uh, the more closer the, uh, activities, like the tangible support being activities of daily living support. The few friends cluster and the restricted are not very different. They lack relative to diverse cluster in all types of social support. So we have those 21% odd people who really are uh, quite lacking relative to diverse cluster in all four types of social support. So what does it mean then? What, does, what, what do we take away from this? Uh, first of all, we take away from it that we do have a continuum from social integration to social isolation. So, yes, we have this effect that the more socially isolated people are, so those with more restricted social networks, that those individuals have fewer social supports, all kinds of social supports. And that fits very much with that literature that uh, that Nancy was describing in terms of those are the people that are socially isolated, those are uh, our concerning people, they're they are lacking in the social supports and therefore also uh, have health issues. What is perhaps more interesting and in, I think personally is that we have these moderately restricted social networks that also have some pro problems associated with, and those individuals as well may have certain social support needs that are not being met. And that really leads us then back to the issue of what about interventions? How do we target interventions um, given what we're finding? And what we're thinking is really that there need to be certain intervention for certain groups of people that we need to target interventions at certain deficits. So 
take somebody who was in that middle group who had, who lacks a so wider social network, that individual may really benefit from attending activities, maybe a senior center, to get those positive social interactions that, at least according to our analysis, they may be lacking. On the other hand, take the person who has a small, uh, has a, a small close uh, family network who may still feel some lacking affectionate support. Uh, let me just highlight here again that interesting cluster of men. Men who, who lack a wider network, yet they seem to, a lot of them are married. What is going on there? And it leads to some interesting hypotheses around uh, first of all, perhaps marital relationships, but also what about masculinity, men not wanting to reach out to the broader network, not getting engaged, what can be done for them that targets meet their needs and ultimately their social support needs. So ultimately we're saying that certain interventions may really need to be targeted at people with specific needs. So let me throw up this uh, slide again, this jumbled really mess of definitions and, and where to go from here, what, what do we think where we need to go is, first of all, we feel that it is important to separate the social network structures, so what people there are in a person's social network and how often people see them from social support because we see different gaps depending in social support. So there are gaps in social support depending on the network structure and the, the specific constellation of people in a person's network. We do still have this really big problem of cutoffs. What cutoffs are meaningful in terms of identing, identifying extremely socially isolated people? those who are socially isolated, but also those in between groups. So uh, they have some restrictions in their networks. Where are those cutoffs? So that's one place we really need to go. And again, as I mentioned, uh, we have now, we also have analyses looking at health outcomes and maybe that will also help us identify some cutoffs and where uh, that will help us ultimately in targeting interventions of uh, people with unique needs. So that concludes our presentation, and we'd be happy to take uh, questions. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Nancy and Verena. It's a very, very interesting presentation. Um, I'd invite all the uh, participants to uh, to submit questions in the um, in the chat panel. Um, there's a few things that have come up quickly. Um, one is uh, just a, in, a bit of information from Joanna Trimble saying that there's an excellent documentary on this issue um, called, I believe it's The Remaining Light by the BC CCPA office. So I'm not sure if, if either of you are familiar with this. No, I'm not. Um, yeah, we can we can certainly post this. I think it'll go along with the slides. We can post the link to this because I think this could be quite interesting. Um, we have a question from Beryl Cable Williams. Um, did people who were identified as having low social or having low networks report having unmet needs or being discontent with their situation? I can take. That one, sorry, I'm getting an echo here. Um, in terms of our restricted networks, uh, yes, we that's those are the groups that really have uh, the the least social support in terms of all kinds of so all the four so types of social support. Uh, how happy are they discontent with the situation? That is an interesting question, and that's really, in a way, um, th that's something we don't have in CLSA. We don't have specific variables around the quality of the relationships, so you might have a lot of uh, 
uh, people in your social network, but they're really uh, po not positive relationships. So you might have one person in your relationship, relationship rather than the social support. But in terms of social support, the more restricted, the less social support. Um, in terms of, I just want to add in, we started off and Nancy talked about loneliness and then we didn't talk about loneliness anymore. Loneliness needs to come back into the discussion because it also relates to the quality of uh, uh, of having, well, of, of the relationship in a sense of what Nancy was saying, does the, what who you have in your relationship actually is what you want in your relationship. So. Uh, that's for another presentation. We're not. That was just beyond the scope of this one. Yeah, and just to follow up with that, we in this particular study we didn't include um, loneliness in it. So that would be, I think, a great measure in terms of the the actual if people were satisfied with their relationships. Um, there is one item in in CLSA that's part of the CEE. DS scale, the depression scale that asks about loneliness, and and we've kind of uh, discussed whether you know putting that as an outcome in, in future studies. So it's a good question. Great. There's another question about communication challenges um, due to sensory losses, vision and hearing. Um, was this one of the causes of low low social supports? We did not look at uh, those variables, and partly, well, mainly because there's another project underway that looks at that very issue. Uh, what we, when I mentioned health measures, uh, we were only looking at function and uh, chronic conditions as as correlates of the social network clusters. When we're looking at then. The clusters and and other outcomes, if you will, realizing it's cross-sectional data. We're looking at mental health, so I can tell you that there is a very very strong effect between social network size. So our restricted clusters have a much much greater likelihood of having mental health issues, including depression. So so that's an aside, but. Uh, uh, we did not look at uh, vision or hearing. Great. And Natasha Kern, thanks you for your presentation, as do we. Um, did the emotional support measurement account for pets or, or therapy animals or only human interactions? It does not include pets. Uh, there is a variable in uh, in CLSA around pets, and in fact, there's a webinar coming up on pets, right? Um, so it, the emotional support is only on human interactions. Uh, so there's a question about the traditional prevalence of social isolation of 20% is high based on CLSA data. It's more like 8.5% plus 1.5%, it says. So is this, <laughs> in terms of what you found, is this what you expected? Um, I well, this is <laughs> oh. <laughs> I can take that one if you want, uh, Verena. Um, sure, Nancy. Yeah. yeah, the prevalence that I showed there um, of 20% was was actually Lubin, using what's called the Lubin scale, developed by Lubin, and it included, um, and it's been used, as they say, in BC and, and by um, researchers out of Europe, and that's where I got the 20% there. Um, this is a scale that includes um, friends and relatives, including your spouse, how often you see them. And it also includes, though, so that's kind of a structural idea, and then includes more of functional. Um, do you feel close to them? Do you, can you talk to your friend about private matters? Um, so I think that, that what we're finding there, I guess I don't want to um, lead you in the wrong direction, is it's again relating to definitional issues. So using that scale, the Lubin scale, that includes structure and function, that's where we're seeing a, a higher a higher prevalence, I guess, of isolation, and the the um, percents that the Verena put there on on the slide. We're still looking into that, by the way, but she just put some uh, measures that we quick, you know, we came up with around structure, um, how often people are seeing um, individuals in their network, um, and so that's where I think we're getting the lower prevalence. Um, if you want to add on to that, Verena. Yeah, just to add on. First of all, you can't 
some 8.5 plus 1.5 because the 1.5 are included in the 8.5. It's just a different cutoff. But if you if you went back to the slide of the different definitions, the the most relaxed one that we put up it would be around that it actually was in the 26 percent so not that far off but it, it depends hugely on your definition and your cutoff it depends on the measures so even if we go back to our cluster analysis and just our two most restricted clusters if we add them up we're at 21 percent of the population of older adults the other ones were including the younger so uh you know it depends Depends on definitions, variables, and cutoffs. Great. So we have another question from Ann Tui, who's actually going to be our presenter, our next CLSA uh, webinar presenter. And she says she's curious if you saw any interesting patterns in relation to SES. And she says she realizes that loneliness and social isolation may not play out in the expected directions. Um, there was surprising little interesting with SES, and I'm defining your SES in terms of uh, education and income. Uh, in fact, um, the, the paper that is on the review, uh, we, we ended up not having income in there because it just it didn't add anything, surprisingly, actually. Uh, but uh, and even education, which is still we, we still have that in the analysis. It, there's nothing exciting there. Okay, from um, Joanna Trimble. Um, as we see the results of social isolation of our elders, at the same time, we are seeing cuts in social programming for this group. Um, I think it's because the programs are seen as frills. How do we get the word out about the importance of such programs to the people who fund them? I think this is a great question uh, for sure. Um, I'm not sure if people are following the, the UK campaign to end loneliness. It's a really bold campaign, campaign to end loneliness. Um, and I think they're kind of leading the way in a lot of ways uh, internationally. They recently came out with a document that was aimed at uh, program planners, service providers, um, urging them to measure um, and evaluate their programs. And they actually included measures of loneliness, five measures of loneliness that the program planners could choose from. And the argument here is that, yes, funders are wanting to show that what they're funding is, I guess, especially in the UK or at this juncture, um, makes a difference. And so they're needing that evaluation component. So I guess, um, I would answer that in terms of if we're doing great things, we need to show that, that they are actually working um, and, and for who they're working for. So learning more about intervention and what's working, I think, will help us with that. Okay, and one more question about would you have any ideas on which variables would be most useful to target isolated caregivers in the community? I'm not sure if I, uh, it's that, uh, it's the question, maybe if we could have a clarification of what that question is in terms of CLSA, which variables, so if you identified the caregivers in CLSA, which ones, which ones of the variables you would use, is that the question, so maybe we can. Yeah, so maybe we could see if there's a clarification to that. Um, in the meantime, um, a question about why you only included the tracking telephone interview cohort. Um, if the cohort with the clinical exam was included, will you get the same six clusters? And is this something that you plan to do? Well, that's why we labeled it a pilot study. We've used tracking cohort people because that's where the people, uh, that was the the cohort that was available when we requested the data. Now, uh, as the commenters indicates, we have the comprehensive cohort uh, as well. Yes, I mean, the idea is to, to look at the other uh, full sample. Would we get different clusters, uh, possibly? Uh, I mean, cluster analysis, just like uh, people who have done factor analysis, cluster analysis is very much dependent on uh, 
well, the people who you have. You're trying to group people in your in the in, uh, in your sample, uh, but also very much dependent on the uh, on the variables included in uh, in the cluster analysis. So yes, the idea is to go move towards the, the comprehensive cohort again. The disadvantage being is now it's no longer nationally representative. So, but yes. Gosh, that was a long-winded answer to saying yes. We will <laughs> use the other the other sample as well. <laughs> at, at, at the same time, I don't know if we would expect that they would differ greatly. Um, there, there are, we've, there's other literature that has looked at different samples and and found uh, not the exact same clusters, but similar clusters. So it's it's centered within a, a larger literature that that we probably wouldn't find uh, too much variation. But there's only one way to find out, I guess. <laughs> So we did get some clarification here. Um, she says that she's simply interested in any useful findings applicable to caregivers in social isolation. Well, I guess it, you know we we as a, as a team we we've talked extensively about definitions of social isolation. So I will give my opinion. I do think it's important to separate the structure from the function. So because I really, so in other words, the size and the frequency of contact is one issue and what it is that these people do is another issue rather than merging the two. And when you look at the social isolation literature, it is very, very messy and some definitions will merge the two and Nancy was mentioning the Lupin scale and while I like the Lupin scale in one sense, it still merges the two issues. I would suggest to keep the network size separate from the function just to get a sense of, so, so you could have one person and that person could be a super helper versus a one person who doesn't help at all. You could have a spouse who who is is not sufficiently uh, supportive and i think we're seeing some of that perhaps in our one of our clusters these are married people but yet they're lacking in certain social supports so i guess my suggestion would simply be keep the the support variables separate from the uh the network size variables Okay, there's another comment. Um, I think many elders self-isolate because they're ashamed of their infirmities and don't want to feel the uh, maybe a burden on others. Have you looked at self-image of those who are socially isolated? We can't do that with CLSA, uh, but it's it's uh, it's a very big issue that, that the self-isolation and why people are socially isolated. So are people, uh, do they want to be alone? Do they, are they, are they just happy to be alone? Uh, we, we, there, there's certainly some people like that. Are they alone, but they, they feel the stigma, for example, of being lonely, admitting that they're lonely. So all these issues actually, uh, we are thinking about, and Nancy can elaborate on if you want, but uh, CLSA, just in terms of the specific question, CLSA does not allow us to look at that at this point. I think it's a great oh. question um, and just kind of gets uh, at that idea of, of yeah, why, especially um, I'm looking a lot right now at the extremely isolated group of individuals and, and people often say, well, some people just want to be alone. Um, but others, as you say, they might be, be self-isolating for, for different reasons. And I think that those are important questions that you, that, you, that you raised. So I'm going to exercise my moderator's prerogative and, and take the last question as there's no additional ones here in the screen. Um, I'm wondering if it's, it's interesting that you look at in the 65 to 85 that age is one of the things that um, defines these groups. Do you find that social isolation is, you know, is it changing over time? Is it specific events? Is it something like, has anyone kind of taken a life course perspective to this and thinking about um, the next wave of data, what sorts of things do you think that you'd like to look at in terms of longitudinal analyses? Well, people have looked at life events and, and Nancy, 
alluded to that for sure in terms of uh, the important transitions over the life course and the big transition would be uh, uh, widowhood uh, where your network changes very abruptly uh, sometimes uh, sometimes more predictably retirement or other uh, is another one uh, divorce so those people have certainly looked at that where I think we can go with CLSA longitudinally we'll see how these network structures change over time so for example so we had six clusters well really five I mean if you think about the two diverse they're really kind of similar five groups of people do they change over time uh, how do they change? What makes them change? So do people become more isolated or do they become less isolated and why? So I think the longitudinal piece will be hugely important uh, and will be uh, eagerly awaiting future phases of the data. And I think the, um, the, the person who brought up caregiving too, that's, that's a really important piece because we are finding um, and we're, we're often, often asked can you be lonely or isolated when you're married? And of course, we're finding that yes. Um, and so what we're potentially not disentangling there is whether some of these individuals who are, who, are, who are isolated are also caregiving. So they have a spouse, but they're caregivers. And so that's, that's uh, explaining um, what's going on for those individuals. Great. Well, in, on behalf of all the uh, attendees of the webinar today, I just want to thank you both, Nancy and Verena, for a very interesting uh, presentation, stimulated a lot of questions and interest and in, you know, thoughts on, on future, thing, uh, future ways that these data can be used. So that was, that was excellent. So thank you very much. Um, I just want to, as well, announce the next webinar, which is going to be December 6th, again, from 1 to 2. And that is going to be by Anne Tui. And it's kind of an interesting uh, progression in terms of, um, you know, going from this, this particular webinar, looking at aging in place with pets. Is pet ownership relevant to social participation? and life satisfaction for older adults in Canada. And again, um, in, in, in seeing all the interest in the data and the questions that have come up in the uh, chat window, I want to remind people that the CLSA data are now available, both the tracking and the comprehensive. And I would invite people to come to the CLSA website and um, look and see what is um, available in terms of you know the broad range of data that we can interrelate in terms of you know social um, isolation and loneliness but all sorts of other areas so again thank you for your time today and we hopefully to see see many of you back here on uh, december 6th